So, as Michal said, I'm Jose. I'm going to talk about uh, the news from the Elixir team, and I'll share a couple news about what we have been doing at Dashbit. So, uh, let's start by sharing my screen and getting the presentation up. Can you see it, Michal? Yes. All always. right. Good. So let's do this. So let's start with the Elixir news. So if you go ahead and install Elixir right now, you're going to get Elixir 1.10. It was released uh, January this year, at the beginning of the year. We reached out more than 900 contributors and we usually share some statistics about you know, how many packages we have on HexPM. We have, we have more than 10,000 packages at the time of the release, now probably more. And we've crossed more than 1 billion downloads. And this is not only about the system. So it's really nice to see that we continue growing, growing healthily. And, um, and yeah, and what do we want to talk about Elixir 1.10? So I'm going to explore four features, uh, Erlang OTP 21 plus requirement, compilation tracers, compile time configuration, and X unit pattern diffing. So the first one, as the title says, Elixir 1.10 requires OTP 21 or later, and we released a patch release, um, which was 1.10.3 that supports the recently launched uh, Erlang OTP 23. And the reason why we added this requirement on 21 plus is because we, Elixir 1.10 fully integrates with Erlang's new logger. So uh, now, for example, all the log levels, all the log messages, all the logger metadata, they are shared between Elixir and Erlang. Before we had two different pipelines, but now it's a single one. Everything is shared. Uh, this was a huge work done by Hanlef, so thank you. And we also added a couple of guards, for example, is map key and is struct that uh, are both based on, they both come from Erlang OTP 21 plus. Another feature that we've included in Elixir 1.10 is one called compilation tracers. And I like to say that this is the best feature that no one will ever use. And we are going to understand why this is the case really, really soon. And um, in, order to, to understand, in order to talk about it, let's talk a little bit about Elixir compilation, okay? So imagine here, in this case, right, we, we are defining a module and we can see, and because in Elixir, compiling code is the same thing as executing code, we can do something like this. We can conditionally define a function in this module. So here we have my module that depends on other module, right? And depending on the value of this condition, this function, some fun may be defined or not, okay? So, um, so what happens here is that when this code is compiled, when we look at the compiled artifact, the bin file, we can see that this module, my mod, has a dependency on other mod, but this dependency is not going to be there in the compiled artifact. It's not going to be there in the bin file, which means that if you're writing a linter, if you're writing something that is doing any kind of static analysis on the code, this dependency is not going to be there, okay? So uh, this is the dependency you're talking about. So Elixir, for a long period of time, we maintained our own database with this information uh, that was private to us, that we used internally. And with time, people, they started using this database, even though they should not, because, but they had no other option, right? And they started asking features. And we did not want to add more data to this database this you may or may not use. So we solved this problem in Elixir 1.10 by introducing the compilation tracers. And the idea of the compilation tracer is that it is a single module that has a single function that receives a bunch of events uh, emitted by the compiler with the compilation environment. So, oh, you are expanding a macro, you are calling a function, you are doing this, you are defining a function, you are importing a module. All those events, they are emitted to the trace, which mean, means now that static analysis tools, linters, they can listen to those events and build their own database with the precise information that they need. And this was launched in Elixir 1.10, and we already seen a bunch of interesting uses for this. So there is the boundary library uh, by Sasha that allows you to say, hey, this module can be called by this module, or this module can only call those modules. 
and it's built on population tracers. Wojtek he wrote a really nice script that uh, can convert imports to aliases. So you give the name of a module and then it goes to your project, finds all the imports and converts them to aliases. Uh, there is a tutorial on the AppSignal uh, blog uh, and there is the official documentation and probably more examples popping up. So, and that's why, so going back to the original joke, right? Like, why is this like the best feature that no one will ever use? Because uh, very few people will actually use the compilation tracer directly, right? Only the people that are writing those um, high level tools that needs to do linking or static analysis. Like most of us, you're just going to use those tools and not touch the tracers uh, directly. But it is an important foundation for us to have in the language because it's definitely going to enrich the ecosystem. Another feature in LX01.10 is the compilation environment. So um, you can write this code in Elixir today. Okay, you can define a module and while you're defining that module, you can read the application environment. So for example, here we are getting the DB host, we are putting it into a module attribute, and then we are starting a connection to this database using this host. This code has one big problem, which is uh, this environment is being read at compilation time which means that if you try to change this value at runtime, for example, in a release, or you want to set it based on an environment variable, it's not possible. You would have to recompile the code. And these, a lot of times, would catch people by surprise. They would set the environment variable and say, hey, I'm setting this environment variable, but I, it's still trying to connect to like my development database. Why is this happening? Um, so, and that's exactly the issue, right? Because it's being read at compilation time while the code is being compiled. Uh, luckily, we have a very simple solution for this problem, which is just don't read it at compilation time, right? You can see here at the bottom, we can read it inside a function, and now the problem uh, was solved. Or even better, don't use the application environment at all, right? Just pass the host as an option. That's better. But assuming that you have to use the application environment, and you have to use the application environment at compile time, Elixir 1.10 introduces a compile env option that, uh, that you use it exactly when you need to read, the, to read the application environment at compilation time. And the benefit of using compile env is that the Elixir is actually going to track it now. It says, hey, you're, you're using this configuration at compile time. So if you try to change it at runtime, if the value when you boot, start your application is different from the one when you compiled it, we are actually going to warn you, so you don't have to spend time trying to figure out what went wrong. So in the future, we're even going to deprecate if you call, you're going to emit warnings if you call get env during compilation time. So if you want to stay ahead, first of all, don't use the application environment, that's the best solution. If you have to use it, use it at runtime. And if you have to use it at compile time, then use compile env. And now the last feature I want to talk about uh, in Alex 1.10 is XUnit pattern diffing. And XUnit always had, not always, but for a long period of time, we have diffing when comparing two values, if you're using equals equals. So if you, hey, if you say the left equals equals right, and then those values are different, we diff those values and say exactly what is different. But we don't have this, we didn't have this feature uh, until Alex 1.10 for patterns. So imagine that you wrote this test where GitHub gist accesses the GitHub API and gets the the, the JSON representation of a GIST. And you're interested only on two fields of this whole GIST, right? You're interested on the truncated value and on the owner. If for some reason this assertion fails, this is the error report, right? It basically shows you like the whole GIST and say, hey, this is what you got. It doesn't match, figure out, right? So you have now to go compile things. You have to compare things one by one and try to find what went wrong. In LX01.10, this is what you're going to get. My screen is not, hold on. Okay, this is what you're going to get, right? It, um, you're going to get an exact, exact div saying, hey, you know, the difference here is that we're expecting the value to be a string, but it was a Boolean, it was highlighted. And next unit, give, it, you can see that it brings the values that you're comparing, the truncated field and the honor field to the top. So you can see really close what you are trying to match with what you received. So this is, um, you know, it feels like a small feature, but it's so important because if it can save you two or three times a day, like 10 seconds, debugging while the test went wrong, 
And then if you apply this for a whole year and for your whole team, it really comes, boils down to actually a lot of time that you're saving um, from the bugging code, the bugging tasks, the bugging things that went wrong. And it's also a feature, again, it looks small, but it's very complex to implement. And all the pattern rules for this work. So uh, the pattern diffing, I want to thank uh, LexMag. He was the one who first introduced the value diffing, the one we had in previous Elixir versions to XUnit. And uh, Glauber Compinho and Jeremy Owens, they are the one who introduced uh, the pattern diffing. So a huge thank you to them. All right, that's what is out. Let's talk a little bit about the future. So Elixir 1.11 is going to be the next release. And you already have a lot of nice things in master about the next release. So let's go through them really quickly. So we added calendar STRF time for the time formatting. So now looking for my time, date, date time, night date time, and everything. So we have uh, formatting out of the box. You don't need to use a third party dependency anymore. Continuing the work uh, on top of Erlang OTP 21, we have more guards, map.field, and is struct. They are now allowed in guards. We added new log levels, and we added support for structured logging. And this is again, it's all of his continuing his work. So Huge thank you. And we are also building on compilation tracers. Now, if we use a module from a dependency, so for example, a lot of people, they end up using a module from OTP, okay? And they forget to add that OTP application to their dependencies. And now when they build a release, their code does not work because that dependency was not brought in. In Elixir 1.11, thanks to compilation tracers, we are, now, we are now warning for this as well. So a bunch of uh, really uh, welcome features to have in the language. And the one that I'm most excited about is that with Elixir 1.11, if you're using OTP 23, you are going to be able to read Erlang docs in the Elixir shell. So this is a, this, uh, the work that we have done in Elixir was minimal. This was a huge effort from the Erlang OTP team uh, on adopting EP48. And, uh, and a huge thank you to the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, in particular the documentation working group, which has been you know, uh, leading those efforts. And one last thing I want to talk about, Elixir 1.11, is that we usually release Elixir every six months, so every January and every July. And this time, we, are, we decided to postpone the release to October 2020, because given everything that was happening, we figured out that if you have one last thing to worry about, it's going to be welcome. So we decided to uh, postpone a little bit the release, and um, yeah, we, we have more time to focus on the things that uh, really matter right now. All right, that's what we had about Elixir. So I want to use the last minute to talk uh, some very quick things about what um, me and the Dash Big team have been working on. So we have recently released Broadway 0 0.6. For those who are not familiar, Broadway is a data ingestion, is a tool for data ingestion and data pipelines. And we, have, we recently added support for Kafka and, uh, and previously we supported SQS, RabbitMQ, and Google Cloud PubSub. Uh, 0.6 also Building cleaning and built-in support for events. We have also released Acto 3.4, and the biggest feature in Acto 3.4 is built-in support for uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And this is what this was a massive effort by Milan Yaric. So a huge thank you to him, and we are glad to welcome him to the Acto team. And it also comes with built-in support for uh, querying JSON and embed fields. So now you can write. So if you're using Postgres or, or, or MySQL JSON fields, you can now query them directly. And one of the things that we have worked a lot uh, since the beginning of the year and was recently launched, uh, and this was an effort from the Dashbit team and the Dockyard team, is the Phoenix Live dashboard. So uh, the Phoenix Live dashboard, it, it comes with every new Phoenix application. So if you update your Phoenix to 1.5 and you build a new Phoenix application, it comes with the live dashboard. And if you're not familiar with the live dashboard, if you're an Erlang developer, um, and for example, you're not familiar with what is happening with Phoenix, the, the dashboard is pretty much observer, but running in the browser. And we have some extra features that uh, make sense for a web application, like request logging, metrics, and so on. So uh, we're really excited about this because about a year ago, maybe a bit more, we started this effort about improving um, the amount of visibility that we have into the virtual machine and your Phoenix applications. And the Phoenix Live dashboard is a great example of this. It's also implemented with Phoenix Live View. 
So, you know, if you are excited about Phoenix Live View and you want to see how everything works, now you have a code base um, to, to use as, as an example. You have an application or a small application, a small dashboard that you can try out and so on. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I hope you have enjoyed the updates. Thank you.